everybody um and a huge thank you again to stella uh duffy for being there what inspirational and grounding words and fun palaces look they are just amazing we all know that i am delighted to be here with everyone um again and i'd like to introduce you to sue williamson um, and a huge oh, I can hear myself. Stella. Sorry about that. Uh, Sue's background is as a librarian and head of library public library services. She believes passionately in the opportunities um, afforded through developing partnerships with public libraries to reach audiences that do not normally engage with the arts and culture. I feel like we can all re we can all relate to that. Um, before joining Arts Council England as Director of Libraries, she managed uh, a library service with a strong focus on arts and culture. Uh, welcome, Sue Williamson. Thank you very much, Holly, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me to be one of the keynote speakers at this fantastic conference and the second day of the conference today. Um, as Holly said, I, uh, before joining Arts Council England, I was head of library services for St. Helens Borough Council and St. Helens Library Service is now one of the six first library services to be part of Arts Council's national portfolio. Um, as well as working in libraries for 20 years, pretty much, um, I've also been a passionate library user since I was a small child. And I'm still often staggered by the flawed perception that people have of what a library service in the 21st century is about. Staff don't wear twin sets and pearls. They're not all female, middle-aged with glasses, although I do hold my hand up to the, all of those. They don't say shh and they're not in decline. On the contrary, libraries are vibrant, innovative places at the heart of their communities, which encourage their customers to try new things and practitioners to think about libraries as places where they could perform and interact with their audiences in an intimate setting, deep in the heart of communities. I'd also like to issue a challenge to all of those in senior roles in any walk of life who might be listening, whose memories of a library are based on visits when they were children. Go and see your local library today and you will find it's very different from your memories and that as an adult, you can see just what brilliant cultural institutions they are and what potential they have. So at Arts Council England, our new strategy, Let's Create, talks about creative people, creative communities, and a creative country. Our chair, Sir Nicola Sorota, spoke eloquently about how libraries would be at the heart of this strategy, and this was endorsed by our chief executive, Darren Henley. At the beginning of our journey to develop our new strategy, we surveyed over 6,000 people, artists, practitioners, adults, and young people. And the message we heard loud and clear was, we want our cultural experiences to be delivered in our communities and for our communities. Libraries can help that to happen. I, I, the other message that we heard was a massive satisfaction rating for libraries. Over 78% of those surveyed thought that libraries did a fantastic job. And this was nearly double the rate for any other discipline. So I believe that libraries have a huge role to play in supporting culture and creativity in the community and that the relationship between artist, library staff and library user is a very powerful one. We have recently published the report on the findings of the South East Library's Touring Inquiry, which you will find on our website. And this was delivered by Creative Arts East in partnership with Farnham Maltings, Applause Rural Touring, the National Centre for Writing, the National Rural Touring Forum, and 26 library services in the southeastern area. And I know that the report has produced some very useful re resources for programming, communication, evaluation, audience development, and arts partnerships, and two guides very aptly named the Really Useful Guide to People Working in Libraries and the Really Useful Guide for Artists Touring in Libraries. These are practical, simple, easy to use, and I think you will find them invaluable in future planning. The Really Useful Guide for Artists manages expectations, explains public libraries and the way they operate, and emphasises the importance of clear communication and indeed mutual clarity. 
Over the last eight years, since libraries became part of the Arts Council after the dissolution of MLA, we have indeed learnt that libraries make great places for arts and culture to flourish. This report surveyed 26 library services in the southeast and had an 80% response rate because librarians are good at responding to surveys and found that there was a real sense that rural touring was mutually beneficial for both libraries and artists. It enabled both to boost their profile and to increase footfall. And libraries benefited in particular from a richer connection with their existing users, a greater opportunity to support their goals, particularly delivery against the four universal offers of reading, culture and creativity, information and digital, and health and well-being, and an opportunity to promote all their services to new users. As I said earlier, we now have six library services in our national portfolio, and they are delivering some amazing work. In Suffolk Libraries, their block programme concentrates on work by young people, supporting young emerging artists, but also through their youth board, developing programming skills and enabling that voice of young people to be heard loud and clear in determining what work goes on in those library spaces. In Cambridgeshire Libraries, the Libraries Present programme has supported artists to think about how they deliver their work in a library setting and has also promoted and supported a strong touring offer. Nottingham, Nottinghamshire Inspire frequently partner with Spark Arts and their adaptation of The Girl of Ink and Stars, the novel by Kieran Millwood Hargrave, was described as an amazing performance with great sound effects and awesome headsets. All the other rural touring schemes in the Midlands, Black Country Touring, Arts Alive, Live and Local and North Ants Touring Arts, tour into libraries too. When I was head of service of St Helens Library Service, which is also now part of Arts Council England's national portfolio, I gained first-hand experience of the magic that can happen in a library space. There is an intimacy and a closeness to the actors and performers that brings theatre, storytelling and music alive. Some libraries are lucky enough to have dedicated performance spaces, some have portable stages and some, like my former service, have very little. The work we did in St Helens and which the report also and the work that the report looks at shows how artists and touring companies can be supported to work in unusual spaces like libraries. Through working with partners such as the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester, 20 storeys high from Liverpool and London-based Cardboard Citizens, I saw some amazing theatre experiences in libraries and some really exciting and moving amateur performances, speaking to that creative people element in our new strategy. I also saw that 32% of our audience came from the lowest super output areas in the borough and 40% had had little or no engagement with the arts or theatre before attending something in the library. And Spark Arts too found that one in five of those attending their performances in libraries had never seen a theatre show with their children before. These figures are powerful and they illustrate the willingness of library users to engage with something in a space that they feel is theirs, in an environment that they can relate to because it's, it's at the heart of their community and because they feel safe and comfortable there. Last year, the BBC worked with libraries across the country to widen an appreciation of VR. They hoped to reach 6,000 people in one month. They extended the project and in three months, they reached a total of 600,000 people and they were absolutely staggered at those levels of engagement. So for performers and producers, this is an opportunity for you to look at what you do and think about it using a new lens, stripping it down to essentials and really examining the heart of your practice. For what is theatre or performance ultimately but storytelling? For library staff, this is an opportunity to see inspirational work in your spaces and to fulfil that old mantra that I was taught that libraries are for education, recreation, information and culture. I have seen children spellbound by a theatre performance of Michael Morpurgo's I Believe in Unicorns in a library. 
and by a fascinating glimpse into the life of Ada Lovelace, complete with a dress which enabled a computer-generated light show. I've seen people engage with the kind of interactive theatre that cardboard citizens produce and weep at a performance of the ragged trousered philanthropists for all the right reasons, all in a library. I have been enriched by that experience. During the recent months, libraries have been able to explore the potential of digital events and activity through their websites, and library staff have had the time and space to explore how they can use digital technology more effectively to provide experiences for their users. In March 2020, following the abandonment of live performances, Spot On, in partnership with Lancashire Libraries, developed a whole new project, Spot On Stories. This was a programme of 27 micro commissions, 10 minute pieces of theatre filmed by artists at home on their smartphones and released twice weekly on YouTube and Facebook. The programme provided income and inspiration for artists and served Lancashire Library and rural audiences with fantastic original content. One of them includes the library in the story by Black Livers, a dog named Grimm who is the guardian of the local library and a wise sage in the tale. You can tell he's wise by the very first piece of advice he gives to our hero, Amos Black. Always bring your library books back in a timely fashion. His final piece of advice is to avoid any Donitz buys. And we find out in the story, they are the tasty, tasty treat that makes all things all right, except that they don't. And to find out more, you'll need to watch them on YouTube. And this work is now an integral part of Spot On's national portfolio activity. As we move into an age of living with COVID-19, I can see that digital services and activity will become much more closely interwoven with physical examples and that they will be seen as two sides of the same coin, not two areas running in tandem. We at the Arts Council, will have a network of digital culture champions and can support the development of work in this area. I'm not going to say that it's always easy. The report has thrown up some challenges for both library services and artists alike, and here are some of them. There's room for development and growth and greater uptake of opportunity. This includes the development of improved comms, social media and audience development skills in library staff. Many library staff are still unsure to how to go about accessing external funding. This is not in their DNA as it is for artists and they need help and support to do this. There is an issue that is particular to staff working on fixed timetables on, in a shift pattern in terms of really engaging them with activity and making them feel a crucial part of the success story. And there's definitely work to be done on staff motivation and sense of ownership and also in increasing staff skills in this area. This is made easier if library staff are closely involved in the programming and the selection of work that takes place, as well as in the performances themselves. They need to be part of the relationship building with performers and artists, as well as for the interaction with users. I absolutely appreciate that sometimes these relationships take time to build, but oh my goodness, they're worth it and they make a huge difference to the quality of everybody's experience. The library service doesn't have to be big, nor does it have to be well served in terms of staffing capacity. My former service had neither of these things. But the sense of pride and achievement that this work brought to the staff in St. Helens, particularly when the service was shortlisted for the Sillip Libraries Changed Lives Award, and when in the following year, it won the National Lottery Best Arts Project as voted for by the public, was both moving and inspirational. For artists, the key issues identified as barriers centred around availability, amount and scope of strategic funding, support for tour management, networking opportunities. How did they make those initial approaches, resources and library friendly marketing materials? My team at Arts Council England and I are trying to support the understanding of rural touring through attending regional libraries connected forums and through direct contact with library services. 
Having libraries connected, the former Society of Chief Librarians is a sector support organisation with a direct line to heads of service through their Basecamp digital forum and an equally direct li line to Arts Council has made an enormous difference. For both library services and touring organisations who would like to work with libraries, please do enlist our help to broker those conversations. The other thing to say before I close is that we live in very uncertain times at the moment, not just because we cannot predict the future trajectory of the pandemic itself, but also because it is, it is likely to have a huge impact on the financial ability of local authorities to provide all their services, not just the library service. And local authorities to date contribute a huge amount to culture across England, nearly 1.1 billion per year. The costs of the pandemic have been and are enormous and will impact on the outcome of the autumn spending review by government. However, the need is greater than ever. We know that art and culture have a huge role to play in supporting health and well-being and that libraries at the heart of their communities are perfectly placed to support the resurgence of art and culture activity. We know that libraries have been a lifeline to those isolating and alone, many without digital skills or the equipment to engage. We know that libraries have provided a raft of resources for families who've been trying to homeschool and, and entertain their children. We know that libraries are seen as having a strong role in getting people back into employment by providing access to resources. And last but not least, we know that in the words of Eric Kleinenberg, the American psychologist, libraries are seen as palaces of the people, places which help communities come together make and build relationships and enjoy shared experiences. We also know that we will be building on really good beginnings as we look to grow and develop opportunities for rural touring companies and freelancers to deliver brilliant work through the library network, both digital and physical. I hope that you will find today both inspirational and informative. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy your day. Thank you very much, Sue Williamson. What an amazing introduction. And we've had Stella Duffy and we've had Johnny Fluffy Bunk and we've had you telling us all about the inspiring work of the libraries and the art services. And it's only 11 o'clock in the morning. I can't <laughs> believe this. This is like NRTF TV. And I don't know what it feels like for you out there. Um, I'm assuming we have an audience at the moment. I can see five faces all smiling at me but we have the frisson of live performance, the, the backstage feel, the nerves, is the tech happening? We know the audience is there in front of the curtains, but we can't see you. People are rushing around and it's, it's just wonderful. So where do we go? This is amazing. I'm Sue Robinson. I'm the director of Culturepedia. We're an independent arts organization based in Blackburn in Lancashire. And we deliver Spot on Lancashire, the county's library and rural touring service. Um, We've been entirely rural since 1995, but in 2014, we set up and developed a pilot library touring scheme. We then had three years of strategic touring funding, and then in 2018, we changed our remit to include libraries in our core national portfolio. A move which ensured for us that we continue to receive investment from our local authority at a really difficult time in local arts funding. And of course, as Sue mentioned, still is and will be a really challenging time for local authorities in terms of cultural provision. Um, but it also introduced, introduced us to new venues, new promoters and new audiences and new artists who had different ways of working. And we love our library work. And I'm not just saying that because Julie Bell is in the room with me. We genuinely have an absolute passion for what we've been doing. So this year of change has forced us as a team, like so many in the cultural sector, to be inventive. And we are, and our relationship with libraries has been the catalyst for this. So thank you to Sue Williamson for the plug and the advert for our spot on stories. Um, that has saved us as a team it's kept us busy it's been good for our mental health and well-being it's given us something to focus on not just in terms of the relationship the library service but also in keeping us going together and um 
if you heard Johnny Fluffy Punk earlier, if you go back, he did a story for us at the early stages of his art shed, and you can see what it looked like then. And also, a um, big thank you to the National Rural Touring Forum, who through the Libraries Programme has helped us fund a craft magazine, which is going out to libraries this week, I believe, um, to reach housebound people who perhaps are not able to engage digitally. And this has enabled us to keep connected and connection and community seems to be a theme that's been growing um, through today. So last week, Isabel Hunter from Libraries Connected wrote a forward in the Guardian Review. Look at this, the Guardian's getting a mention a lot. What, what sort of group of people, here we are. There we are, Guardian Review. And she quoted Julie Bell, one of our panelists. And Julie Bell says, so many different people are desperately in need of being able to connect again. And Isabel Hunter then goes on to say, but with hard work and ingenuity, I am certain our libraries will continue to fulfill one of their most vital functions and once again become the community's living room. And it's this phrase, there we go, it's there, the word living room that I really picked up on because in the rural touring sector, we talk about living rooms. It's a place where people come together in the village hall to socialize, chat, tell stories. And we find ourselves in a strange place right now where the living room is political. Many of us in the country are not allowed to socialize in our living room right now. So where are our common places? And public spaces like museums, theaters, village halls and libraries are all safe managed places where we can connect as audiences and as artists and people and share our stories together and well-being. So libraries is our living room. Um, Julie, I've picked on you and mentioned you and I haven't introduced you. So I'm going to go through the panel and each one of you are going to speak for a couple of minutes about who you are and what your passion is about libraries and, and the arts. So can I ask Julie Bell to come in for a couple of minutes? Hi, okay. Thank you very much, Sue. And thank you to both Sue's for the plugs for Lancashire Libraries and our work with Spot On. Um, I think for me, I've worked within Lancashire all of my life. I've been really lucky to work and live in a county that I absolutely love and is very much a rural county. So it presents its own challenges in terms of how do we deliver different cultural experiences to the public. So we do have our own theatres, etc., but they're nowhere like the grand theatres of, you know, the Manchesters and the Liverpools that are in the northwest. But what we offer across Lancashire County library services are 70 different venues when we include our museums. And those venues range from tiny, tiny uh, converted stable block in Silverdale on the border with Cumbria, um, where you will find a very literary community um, right up to kind of the Burnleys and the kind of Harris libraries. And I would say the Lancaster Library and it's my turn to give a plug now to one of the things that we actually introduced into um, into the world from Lancaster Library which was Get It Loud in Libraries. Um, proudly that was one of my members of staff who is no longer one of my members of staff but I serve on his board now and I'm really proud to, to kind of see what Get It Loud in Libraries is doing right across kind of the northwest and into Scotland. Um, and would you believe we had one of our support acts as Adele, she wasn't even the main act so you know it's really kind of knowing that as one of my staff says to me um, and it's a quote I keep coming back to I love the palaces of the people bit that Sue talked about but libraries are places where anything can happen and you can be anything and working with partners <clears throat> like Sue's team the spot on team working with um you know, uh, Stella's inspirational idea around from palaces and bringing our community artists into, into the fore as well. We just provide those experiences as Sue Williamson has so brilliantly described for people that may not be able to access that. You know, when you're relying on the last bus back being 10 o'clock or something like that, to be able to go and experience something at Hesham Library on the coast or in the middle of the Ribble Valley um, is absolutely amazing. So. For me, um, I'm just so delighted that A, I get to work with brilliant people like Sue Williamson that supports um, what we're doing, that Sue Robinson's organization can provide those forums and things to happen within our buildings. And, you know, that, you know, staff are engaged and excited about it too. And so are our communities. So um, yeah, 
thank you for having that opportunity to speak about that. I'll leave other people to talk now. <laughs> thank you very much, Julie. I'm going to move to the other end of the country, which is a strange concept on Zoom, but I know that she is there. Um, Hattie, rural, you're in Devon. Um, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Paddle Boat Theatre and what you do? Yes, hello. Thanks, Sue. Um, so my name's Hattie Brown and I'm co-founder of Paddle Boat Theatre Company. So we're based in Devon and we've been going for about six and a half years. We make shows and theatres for children and families kind of across the southwest but further afield as well. Uh, we work extensively in schools and uh, go into schools for creative residencies where we bring drama into the classroom and use that as kind of research and development process to create our new shows as well. Um, and then these new shows will tour to a variety of spaces around the Southwest, theatres, schools, libraries, and obviously, um, yes, and libraries. Um, libraries have been really vital throughout our, our process. So we've premiered and toured work there. We've run family drop-in workshops, um, and we've also helped program schools and other artists into library spaces as well. Um, we see libraries as really vital um, and inclusive spaces for our audiences, because a lot of them don't feel um, comfortable venturing into theatres. Um, so it's a really nice first step for building audiences in for us and for library users as well. Um, this has been really especially true for work in Torbay and Torridge, which are quite deprived areas of Devon. Um, there's a lot of rural and small town deprivation in Devon. And being able to go out to really small libraries right on the edges, edges of the county and reaching those communities there has been really fantastic and vital to the work that we do. Um, yes, that's kind of us in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, we, we're paddle boat. Thank you, Hattie. That's lovely. I'm going to move across the country to Leicestershire, where I know Adele Al-Saloum is listening in. So you mentioned your work at Spark Arts um, for Children. Um, accessing communities who are isolated, I believe, is very much part of the work. Do you want to introduce yourself and, and explain a bit more about that? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Sue. Um, so my name's Adele. I'm the director of the Spark Arts for Children. Um, we're a, a charity, an arts organisation in Leicester, and we work with um, children, not 13, and, and all of the people that occupy children's lives. So that's teachers, that's librarians, that's um, parents. Um, that, that is everybody, really. Um, our, our work is uh, quite varied. We're a multi-art form venue, uh, not venue, organisation. Um, and our venues are quite typically uh, a library or a school hall or a community centre. Even on occasion, they've been swimming pools and sport halls. But we very much are um, looking to try and create extraordinary opportunities in places that you might least expect. Although more regularly, we, we do expect to see theatre in libraries nowadays, certainly across the East Midlands. Um, one of our programmes, which is called Among Ideal Friends, it's a consortium of five local authorities working across Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. And over the last four years, we have been um, both programming and commissioning new family work to tour into libraries. We have a consortium of 55 libraries and we tour three shows a year. Um, and it's been it's been the most wonderful, um, exciting journey, both in terms of working with with new companies to program that work into those spaces. We've had all sorts of work from um, circus. We've, we've had uh, Upswing Circus who did who brought beds into the library spaces and we did sort of acrobatics um, to creating and commissioning our own work. A, um, a piece called The Girl of Incan Stars, which was commissioned by um, inspire culture learning and libraries. So a real mixture of work, but really looking at how we can tell stories right in the heart of communities and make people feel that, that I suppose what, what happens when you delve into a book and you delve into your imagination is a whole world of other possibilities happens. And I suppose what we're doing through our, or aiming to do through our touring consortium is trying to um, open up those worlds and open up those imaginations, not just of children, but everybody that's connected to children. That's fantastic. Thank you, Adele. Um, Sue Williamson, you've already introduced yourself to us earlier, but perhaps um, you can help us move into, into the first question and the first challenge that we've been set by the NRTF. I've actually had a question come through on the Zoom group chat, which is really prescient, I think. And um, one of the, the uh, audience members have mentioned that um, St Helens Library is now an MPO of the Arts Council. And is that a direction of travel for library 
funding. And this is particularly in relevance to the fact that so many local libraries are, are a foyer service right now. Um, and he says that the space is closed for reader and safety reasons. So how does, how does the world we are in now, which we have to accept we are in, um, how does this work for performance and artists maybe over the next few months? And what are the challenges or opportunities that, that artists can, can tackle now, say, between now and spring, looking forward, that enables performance and art to happen? So I'm going to ask you to answer that, Sue, and I definitely know Adele will be able to jump in on the back of that one. I think we're living in the most changing and, 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 and volatile time that I ha have ever lived in, and, and, and I'm no spring chicken. And frankly, it's, it's incredibly difficult to answer that question because... Um, things are changing on a daily basis um, where, I mean, I live in Lancashire like Julie and last night we heard that um, Liverpool is in um, level three of lockdown and Ma Greater Manchester is on the cusp of that and that there are other places that might be going to do that as we speak. Um, the So it, it's really hard to say how or to foresee how it's going to be possible to do very much physically until we have a little bit more clarity and security about bringing people together. However, as I said in, in my speech, I think the, the potential and the possibility of doing digital work at the moment is, is really high. And I think actually it's been great for library staff uh, who have kind of had the time and the space and the bandwidth to get to really get more familiar with how they can use digital stuff. And our network of digital champions at Arts Council are really poised to help people expand um, those, those areas of expertise, if you like. And I think what it's also shown for library services is that maybe in the past we've talked about a physical service, and Julie will be able to, to, to back me up on this, I hope, a physical service and a digital service. And I think what we're going to be seeing in the future is a much more intertwined service, a library service that has that, that gives digital and physical experiences for everybody. So I'm hoping that out of this, out of, out of a period of change comes opportunity always. So I think it's for, you know, library services and for rural touring um, organisations and artists to think about how they can ex change the way that they are delivering stuff to meet the, what, we, what we're loosely calling the new normal. But I think in terms of, 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 physical, of, of physical library spaces, we're literally working from week to week. And, and I think one of the things that we're trying very hard at the moment, because Arts Council is the National Development Agency for Public Libraries, and I have a weekly call with DCMS talking, and, and um, on which um, Isabel Hunter from Society, uh, from Libraries Connected also sits, um, talking about the, the issues and concerns that library services have about remaining open and how how that is, is changing and what we're really really pushing for at the moment is that um, library services will be seen to be an essential service and will be able to remain open given all the safeguards that have been put in place but for performance and gathering that's going to be a much much longer term aspiration I feel. Thanks, Sue. So I just want to uh, take that over to Adele, because I've all had little secret chats with you all before, before, and I know you want to pick up on that, and then maybe over to Hattie as well. So Adele, do you want to pick up on that from your point of view? Yeah, so um, one, of the, one of the pieces of work that we lead on locally in Leicester, so we work with um, the Leicester Neighbourhood and Library Service locally, and we have a, a programme called Artists in Residence, which, as it suggests, it's about artists sort of working in residence in a library. Um, and, and obviously for the for the first six months of lockdown, our artists were on furlough, but they have started to return and libraries have opened Our artists have been back in the library one day a week. And we're working very slowly and very tentatively. But the wonderful thing about artists is that they can turn any kind of restriction into an opportunity. Um, they really do think and behave very differently. And that skill set is, is really refreshing when you're looking at how you start to open your doors again in libraries. So just to give you some examples, one of our artists has um, just the, the whole notion of sort of being socially distanced. She's um, started to talk in the, about um, 
two meter performance bases and that we all have our own two meter performance bases. So as a family come into a library and, and, and acknowledging that only a family can only come in, we can only have six families in the library for only 15 minutes of time. So we're meeting families one-on-one -on -one between the artists. She's offering, she's giving them some tape and we're creating our own two meter performance area of which anything is possible within that taped bit of carpet that happens to be two meters wide. And all kinds of interventions. She, and the artist has also started thinking about the locality outside. So how do you take the library out? There's a primary school across the road. There's a car wash on the corner. And during, um, and I'm sure um, Stella talked earlier about the, the tiny revolutions and the fun palaces. The last weekend, our tiny revolution was about taking the library out. So we had we had a Mr. Magnolia cut out along the sort of the gates of the school. The, the car wash on the corner had a tiger waiting to, to sort of, um, the tiger that came to tea. And we started to sort of get, the artists started to go out and see how she can sort of make the library spill out into the immediate locality so that people, I suppose people and children and families at least feel that that offer of libraries is still there, even if they can only access it for a very small time and they can only access it for 10 minutes. And quite often, um, it's those 10 minutes that we might treasure. Um, so, so that interaction between an artist and a family that might be very low key and it's very intimate, the inspiration that might leave, leave a family feeling quite upbeat and, and feeling good about themselves all day. And I think um, the most interesting, I think, part of this journey we've gone on with Leicester Libraries since September, so still only six weeks into working in this way, is that it feels that the, the library surface are looking at sort of artist pedagogy as part of a recovery, of part of reopening. And all of this activity has been scrutinized by public health. We, you know, in Leicester, it's extremely challenging. So the fact that we, the, these ideas are also sort of being, being sort of sent back up the sort of the ch chain command to public health and being sort of allowed to happen, I think is really refreshing. So certainly I think, if you can, you know, just 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 having an artist as part of that process and seeing what happens is a really sort of exciting way in which to start thinking about um, performative openings, even though it's very small and intimate. Thank you, Adele. Julie, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but chains of command. That's what I'm going to come to you about, because I know that you're, you're at the top of command there. Hattie, as a, as a maker and producer of a, a small scale company, Devon, what's your, your response or feelings towards being a creator at the moment? Yeah, there's sort of two opportunities that kind of sprung to mind listening to, to you all talk about that. Um, one that we've, we've been involved in. So Cambridgeshire Libraries Present have done two kind of commission rounds, right? one right at the start of lockdown and one that's kind of is going on now. And we were lucky enough, we've been lucky enough to be on board with both of them. Um, so the first one, it was a series of uh, one storytelling video when a series of kind of craft activities and things for kids to do at home. And what we found with that was really fantastic. The first video reached around 20,000 people. That's much larger than our normal, our normal online reach. And it also allowed us to do um, something that offered, um, it was BSL interpreted. And um, it offered a potential kind of new, new uh, something that uh, for people that might not normally go into a library or feel kind of excluded from, from seeing art in, in, in the live. But because it was digital, um, we, could, we could offer that to a much wider audience. Um, so the kind of the digital offers is, is something kind of, Gives the opportunity for something new and uh, for people that might even might feel a little bit a bit nervous even even going into a library um the other opportunity that i just thought of now is um looking at kind of hyper local artists um and making because looking, looking at local lockdowns not being able to travel from county to county um thinking about how libraries can work with artists on their doorstep and kind of doing that, as, as you say, Adele, through a collaborative approach. Um, we're really lucky in Exeter that the library, we've got four libraries in the city. It's amazing. Um, but looking at even those more rural places, seeing, seeing what artists are there already. That's great, Hattie. Thank you for that. So, Julie, you're at the top of chain of command and you're um, in a role where you are a provider of well-being and culture, thinking about the four themes and uh, culture and creativity is one of them. But you are also a health body and, a, and, a, and an organisation with a, a statutory health responsibility. How do you juggle all of this about 
maintaining public health, but also ensuring that Adele and Hattie and all the other creative creatives who are listening at the moment are feeling that there is something that they can they can tour and work with. Um, and I'm, you know, in Lancashire, but also in, in other libraries around the country. Yeah. I do think, as Sue said already, you know, this is an extremely challenging times. And, you know, I would really welcome more work being done with our collaborative members like yourself, Sue, and, and other organisations as well. But at the moment, we are very much on this in this tier two, as we found out last night. And it's about just how many people we can allow through our doors. But we are ambitious to do something moving forward. It's this whole business around um, what our public health colleagues would like us to do and how we minimise that risk. So it is about exploring all those different opportunities. And I'm excited to hear what Adele was having to say. You know, that's something different. We're looking maybe, you know, to... We have a body of young volunteers within Lancashire called our Culture Hacks. They were our reading hacks way back in the day when the reading agency introduced that. There are young volunteers. And we have worked with artists with our Culture Hacks. We changed their name earlier on this year. Um, those young volunteers have created their own um, curated events within our library spaces, within two library spaces with funding from the Carnegie Trust um, a couple of years ago. So they've got that taste now for how can they do things. And I know that the brilliant Heather Fox who works with me, she's my great cultural um, development manager. I'm really lucky to have Heather. Um, she's always looking for those opportunities. You know, that's why she's worked with you and Spot On Sue to produce that zine, which apparently has fallen through her letter box this morning so I'm looking forward to seeing it in my letterbox there will be that you know hard copy that we will be able to send out so that's a different format I know from performance in in our buildings but that um, magazine is going to encourage all sorts of people to get engaged with different types of art they'll be able to engage with um, local author Stacey Halls um, they'll be able to engage in making things and that's you know one format that's a safe format at the moment but it's always looking forward to how can we develop so get it loud for instance the academy the get it loud academy is for young people developing young people's ambitions within the music world they can under the national youth agency guidelines work with those young people so i hope that answers your question it is tough times it's about being imaginative and creative about what we can actually do in a safe way um but yeah i'll take lots of learning back from what i've heard from hattie and adele thank you for that thanks thank you julian thank you for the uh the, the other plug this is this is great fun um sue williamson i'm going to come to you and now for the next uh development of this um i run a small business hattie's in a small business and so adele and we all know that we've relied on furlough and grants and all sorts of things that in all honesty have kept us going while we we wait and we keep waiting for things to change and the arts council's 10-year strategy feels to me that it, it may have had some post-it notes scribbled all over it recently and it may well have had a few lines put through it how how much has this sudden reactive changing which i know you're still going through with with recent decisions um has resulted in ripping up in bits of paper and gluing things back together again and how do you see the sort of next next six, six months for small scale companies like these two? Mm. Um, again, <laughs> it's a really challenging question. Um, the actual strategy, let's create, we should have been launching it in um, March, April this year, and it was going to be accompanied by a delivery plan. Um, that is it is the, not the strategy itself that we've been putting um, post-it notes and what have you across. It's the delivery plan, which we are trying to work on. But as I'm sure you can appreciate, the work that we've been doing to deliver our emergency response funding for the last three or four months has pretty much closed out everything else um, to a, a, a massive extent. And, and I mean, we were delighted to be able to announce um, what we did yesterday and there's a second round of funding due to be announced I think we're hoping by the end of October plus the next level up um, much bigger grants and loan applications that people could also apply for so um, all the time as we're as we're looking at this we are thinking about how the, the things that people are telling us about the challenges they're having to face at this time is going to impact on our delivery plan going forward. And, and 
Uh, so we're, con we're kind of having those discussions um, alongside this, but at the moment there still works in progress. So there's not really an awful lot that I can tell you, but I can tell you that rural touring is something that we we think is hugely important in terms of doing what what the whole ethos of the of the of Let's Create is about which is bringing culture into communities in small spaces. I mean, again, another thing that we were told when we were talking about this is that some of the language that we use and that artists' communities use is, is so rarefied and so um, kind of of us and of our, our kind of communities that we need to change it. We need to make it much more accessible so that people really understand what it is we're trying to do, which is basically bring really great stuff to every to, to as wide an audience as we possibly can. So I think all I can really say on this is that, you know, we will be looking to see how we can support uh, as much as possible. The, we've just announced also um, a new round of Develop Your Creative Practice funding um, for individual artists. And we've also opened up our project grants to national portfolio organisations, providing that they are working towards something which is going to support artists and freelancers in recovery because normally speaking npos can't apply national portfolio organizations can't apply for project grants when they're also in receipt of um uh, um of portfolio organization funding of regular funding so we, we're doing as much as we can with the money that we control to try and get um opportunities out there that people can work with um and as soon as you know we will be absolutely making sure that everybody is kept apprised as our thinking as as we move through the next few months Thank you. Um, I can certainly say from our experience of how we felt in March and April as a small arts organisation, you know, and this this came crashing through into our world and we, we had to readapt that it, that the Arts Council's adaption and changing to that over the last has um, past few months has been really welcome. Um, but obviously there is there is some concern and we're concerned about uh, local authority cuts, we're concerned about a, a recession. And if I try and think about it too much, you, you almost cease to be creative. Um, so I want to just come back Actually, to Adele. Before, before you leave me, perhaps it's just worth saying on that point that, of course, the other thing we're waiting on is the outcome of the um, autumn spending review. I mean, we, we're expecting that, um, but we're not sure what format it's going to take. Everything at the moment is being influenced by the pandemic. Um, so, I, I mean, once we once we have a sense of, of what that is going to be for us, we'll have a, we'll have much more clarity about what the next few months are going to look like. That's great. I've just got a couple of questions uh, coming through. And the first one, I'm going to go back to Hattie, I think. Um, it's about audiences. We can all think about this. When you think in terms of libraries, what's an audience and what, what do we assume an audience is in a library or what is really an audience when we're talking about libraries? So sometimes in rural touring, we get into a trap of talking about rural audiences and then we go, well, what does that mean? An audience is an audience and it's a place. So in terms of... Um, how do we challenge the stereotypes of what an audience might want to see in a library and how do we get those audiences in? Pandemic to one side in, in our old world, how do we do that? Who's going first? I'm going to pick on Hattie and then go up to Adele and then we'll come back. Um, yeah, um, so obviously we, we market for families and children but um, all of our shows are inclusive and one thing that we found which has been fantastic when we work in libraries is the number of people that are in the library already just using it and see that there's an event on for free or for a few pounds um, and just stay. And that's something that's really, really special about about kind of growing those audiences that might might not consider themselves as a theatre, a theatre going audience um, that are, are just using the library for something else. And I think that's there, there's kind of a germ of an idea there that actually there's kind of this accidental viewer um that is is in in the space already um that you don't get in any any other place you don't get that in a village hall really they don't hang around there they don't they don't get that in a theater but in libraries they're already there they're already using the service and they'll they'll kind of join in with a workshop or an activity or a show 
And then actually what often happens after our shows is they stay and take some books out. And it kind of is a much more fluid, a, a kind of a fluid um, category. It's not, they're not coming just for that show, they're coming for the day and, and using that space in a multitude of ways, one of which is maybe watching your show. So I think just saying their audiences is, is kind of too small a word, but yeah, they, that's what we found, which is really nice. That's lovely. So people happen to be there and they stumble across it. Adele, is that is that your experience? What's yeah, your... I, 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 I might borrow that phrase in future, the accidental viewer. We've absolutely got some experiences of that. We, we did a Christmas show a number of years ago. It was um, an adaptation of Mike Kenny's um, it was The Emperor's New Clothes, but it was called Big Sister, Little Brother. And it was for children. It was, um, and we had these, um, there was these elders in the library who who come every day to read their paper. And before we knew it, we had, and they sort of slowly, you could see them sort of gravitating towards the children's section of the library. And they ended up sat, um, six gentlemen of senior years sat on a bench and just completely enjoyed this um, this this two hander with with this sort of a, an audience of 120 sort of um, 10 year olds that were that were in the library that day and it is that it's the serendipity of knowing that it, it, there is always there'll be a target audience in this instance it, it was an offer at Christmas for local schools but knowing that that these these elders are probably you know recognise their grandchildren or children of the ages of their grandchildren in the audiences, but then also the teachers or the nursery nurses or the library staff, quite often you you create a, a space and try and make it um, a dedicated space that's not too uh, doesn't impact on the rest of the service. But by and large, you start to see the creep. And if it's good theatre, which I'm sure we're only interested in putting good theatre into these spaces. And it speaks to anybody, irrespective of the fact it was designed with the 10 year old child in mind. Good theatre talks to, to the child in us all. And, and it's, it's, those, it's those moments where you do see that, that creep, those accidental audiences starting to gravitate towards something that's a collective experience and a shared experience in that moment. That's fantastic. We've got a little follow up question to um, that, which I'll come back to Hattie and then Adele. And then I've got one for Julian Sue. So, um, this is an interesting question. There's an assumption in this. Should library audiences pay the same as other audiences? What, what does other audiences mean? What's a library audience? So ticketing, what is it? Is it a library show? Or is it a professional theatre show? Who wants to grab that one first? Hattie, go on. It's a really contentious issue. We found it. So last year we did a 40 venue community tour of our show. Um, and that encompassed 11 libraries. Um, eight rural touring venues, some theatres, some schools, um, and we, we kept butting up against that issue in the fact that the library, uh, theatres wanted to charge £10-£12 per ticket, sometimes you could watch it for free in a, in a library if they had funding, um, but what we always try and do is suggest a, suggest a small fee, um, because we think there's, there should be a value, uh, the user should know there's a value that they're watching, you know, this is, doesn't happen every day, um, whether that is a, just a donation, but there, there, should, there should be something there that the audience, audience give back. Um, but yeah, and there, there's definitely, there's, some, there's an imbalance there because, um, because of funding issues and how much we can subsidise it ourselves, how much the libraries can subsidise it. Um, but I think, that, I think there should always be some give from, from the audience member, whether that's 50p or £5. And, and how much, just generally, in some of the shows you've done, has that box office income from a library been part of your, your core income? Hasn't? So last year we ran the model there where the libraries gave us a set fee, I think it was about £160. Um, and we subsidised it from Arts Council and um, Heritage Lottery Fund, our end. And then it was sort of, we kind of, we get suggested ticket prices to the, to the libraries, but they, it was up to them in the end. Um, and their, the, all the money was from their uh, Friends of Pots. So that wasn't from, so it was through Libraries and Limited, which is an MPO, but they, it wasn't with their MPO money. Um, and it was up to them if they wanted to charge ticket prices. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Um, but that, that model worked quite well because it was, it lowered the risk for us as a company. Um, and yeah, it worked okay. And that, that risk element, so artistically and financially is quite important. Has that been your experience, Adele, in terms of um, audiences and... 
Yeah, okay. so we've, um, it's, and, and because we've been working, the consortium's been sort of three years now, and, and we have moved from a position when we very much first made an application to establish the consortium, some of our local authorities had never charged, and mm -hmm. there was resistance to charging, but I was quite, I suppose I was quite, um, a confident that people would see the value and pay for it but also felt that when you are in receipt of, of public funds from arts council or from local authority that you really do also need to demonstrate that you're sort of diversifying income that, that you kind of felt that there was a an ethical issue there about saying well it can't all be can't all be free it can't all be mm. by arts council as generous as arts council are so we and actually we've moved successfully moved we started off charging two pound fifty three pound fifty um, and clearly it is different between the county and the city um, and, and certainly families may be larger, family groups may be larger in the city. So we've also got family deals. But typically now, I think um, in Rutland and Leicestershire, it's five pound a ticket. Um, and then there are deals in some of the cities like Leicester where you can get a family ticket for 10 pounds. So, so it, it ranges, but we do add value to it. And I do, I absolutely feel that there should be, that we, I'm sure, you know, in advocating for, for art, you also have to advocate for its value. So, so absolutely yes to tickets. But in terms of whether it would should sort of equate to that of a theatre show, I mean, I just, I just, for me, that would be no, because I think I'm not, I think going to the theatre also is wonderful and the magic of the, of the blackout and the lights and, and that opportunity. So all families should also go to the theatre. It's not a choice of either or. It's about making sure that that's, there's an, enough opportunity for all. And I think, I understand why theatre costs so much more because there is so much more involved in running that building, the technical staff that are that are giving you that light show and and making that experience um, so much more. Um, so I, I certainly would not try to push it into the rounds of, of theatre ticket prices, but, but absolutely would say that we need to be charging for, for this high cultural provision that, that families are getting. Thank you, Adele. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to, uh, we could just spend all day doing this. This is just like, it gets richer and richer conversation. I'm really sorry to have to stop you and move on to another one, but we've got questions coming through from, from our audience. So this one, I'm going to pass to Julie Bell. Um, it's quite a naughty question, really. How do we sell all of this? This is the actual question. How do we sell all of this to librarians? some of whom might be a bit conservative and cautious on all levels. So I'll let you unpick all those assumptions or challenge them in, in a couple of minutes, if that's okay. And then I'm going to come to you, Sue. Okay, so a really fair question as well. Um, just like any sort of profession, we have a whole range of people that have already, you know, all sorts of different ambitions and, and things that they want to do within their working profession. So um, for us, and I was reflecting on this too, because I was thinking about when I started my career, which was in lovely Blackpool in, you know, kind of 30 years ago, where the head of libraries managed the library and the art gallery, but we never really mixed the two. It was always kept as very two very different places. And now kind of 30 years on, you know, we're introducing all sorts of different opportunities within libraries. And yes, it can be quite challenging. And I think, you know, if I if I think about Heather again and her team and how they work with people like yourselves to kind of say, you know, but the possibles, the impossible is possible. You know, it's not like going to the theatre like Adele says, but it's about creating experiences within our libraries. And for many people, that will be, as Sue Williamson said, the very first time they'll have experienced any type of, of theatre or music. And we're lucky in the types of different events that can happen within our spaces. So it's about saying, you know, look, let's try this. You've got the very ambitious librarians who were up for absolutely anything, as you know, and will go for it. Um, and then you've got the ones that are quite timid. And especially, I think recently we've had some quite different sort of um, artists that have been offered to us to, to showcase within our libraries. And that's quite a challenge, really, when you're giving somebody that's very diff different and nobody's heard of. And how do you market that to a new audience? But yeah, I think um, for me, I'm really passionate about it as head of service. I have a I have a duty to ensure that my staff are open to all sorts of experience as well. Never mind, you know, the 
that the, our communities that we work in so it's all about saying this you know we can make this happen and we generally do I think quite successfully um so whether it's somebody like you've showcased with us being the past as, as as kind of Roger McGough a big headline that we know that we're going to get a big audience in or you know a get it loud gig with somebody like Ellie Golding or something like that to somebody like Jackie O'Hagan a single woman show really bearing her all literally um in in to a, a small audience in Hesham Library. That's what this is all about. And we've got to be able to articulate that to our library staff to say, you know, you've got to try these different places and, you know, trust us, you will enjoy it. And, it, and I think the word is getting out more and more. People want to participate all the time. As Hattie and Adele have spoken about their brilliant experiences, that's what we've got to share that good practice within our libraries as well. Thank you, Julie. We've got about uh, one more question I'm going to put to Sue and then I'm going to put a question to all of you because um, I know that we're, time is running out. So um, I started this with quoting Isabel Hunter about talking about the community's living room and artists love to break rules. So as soon as you tell me I can't do something, we all start looking, but could I just, but could I just? And I love the idea that, that I can probably meet a friend in a library and bump into them socially distancing in the way I perhaps could not in my own sitting room. And if libraries are our living rooms and theatres are now offering books and museums you can sleep over and um, village halls are where there are food banks and well-being um, sessions, is this notion of a library, a museum, a theatre and an arts organisation just a sector definition? And really, we just have all these buildings, they're all public, that are our living rooms and we can go and pick on our living rooms and enjoy them in the way that we want and enjoy some culture in them. And Sue, I'm going to let you answer that last question before I then come to everyone else with our final comment. Oh, blimey, um, that's a question and a half. Um, I think to a certain extent, yes. But I think that um, my experience when I was working in libraries, I would say it's about what people perceive to be their living room. For some people, a theatre or an art gallery is not a living room. It's not something that they've engaged with or their parents have engaged with or their grandparents have engaged with. They are frightened. I've sat in an audience with people um, when um, youth orchestras were playing who don't know if they can get up and go to the loo, when they should clap, when they whether they can talk, whether they should be silent. It's an alien, it's a different experience for them. And I think, so the, the, the question for me is, well, you know, if, if, if what you're saying is likely to happen, how do we enable that to happen? How do we get people those first steps along the road? And I think that's where libraries do come in, because I think people do feel comfortable going into a library. For some, I would accept it maybe even goes further back than that. It might go to the, the nursery school experience or the health visitor experience or the community centre experience or the food bank. But I think that's why we all need to work in partnership together to try and grow these audiences um, where we can. Has that answered your question? I've kind of, it was kind of a long question. I'm not sure if I've got everything that you wanted in response to that. I believe it's a long philosophical discussion over coffee and cake kind of question. And I've, I've, had, yeah. my, I've had my message from Ellen going, move on, please. So I would say um, I've got one final question to ask of all of you. And I'm going to start with Hattie. Could you all please recommend to our audiences a really good read to keep them busy for the next week. Go on, Hattie. Okay, I prepped this. I knew you were going to ask me. Um, this is called The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. It's by Rachel Joyce. It's coming up backwards in my screen, but I don't know, it might be fine in yours. Um, I read it during lockdown, and it's really nice. And it's, it takes you all through England, from South Devon up to Northumberland. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just about a middle-aged man walking on his own and the people he meets. And it was really fantastic when I was locked up in my house. I couldn't leave, really. Um, it just took, yeah, took me out, out of myself and took me into kind of those rural areas that, that we've been talking about today. Thank you, Hattie. So, Julie, what can you recommend to us? Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um... We have e-books in libraries as well as um, physical books. Um, that book was Freya by Anthony Quinn, and he's becoming fast one of my favourite authors. Not very well known, I don't think, by lots of people. He writes from with a really good um, 
woman's voice um, and he's taken me all the way from the suffragettes to now Freya is in the 1950s 60s and uh, that whole thing around kind of coming out of the war and their adventures up until the six in the 1960s so I would definitely um, go for Anthony Quinn now any new book of his is on my list and as I say not many people know him so make sure you read him guys <laughs> thank you Julie and Adele so I've got with me uh, The Girl of Ink and Stars by Kieran Millwood Hargreaves, which is a wonderful, is a magical, mythical adventure across the land of Hoya. Um, I love it for numbers of reasons. I think it, it's, it's so rich, and especially when you're looking at, at, at fiction for young people, I think, I think sometimes we underestimate the ability for children to really imagine uh, Quite, quite dark and sometimes um, dangerous situations. So, so this is a favorite because um, the, the, the girl, is, Isabella is the major protagonist and girls do love adventures. Adventures are not just for boys. So I like it because it breaks that stereotype of our, of our hero being a, a young, young girl who's 11. Um, and I also love it because I've had the, the pleasure, this is a little bit of a shameless plug, but I had the pleasure of adapting it for Inspire Culture Learning and Libraries, which was a theatre show last year. And just this September, we've created the audio drama version of it, which is being released this October across libraries. Um, and so if, if you're interested, you should certainly look at Inspire Culture and Libraries uh, web page and get the audio version, which has been beautifully written by Satinda Chohan. And it's got um, sound design by Craig Beer. So it's got binaural sound. So a real treat either to read or to, to join us in our audio drama. Thank you, Adele. So I'm going to end today's session uh, with Sue because we started with you as a keynote speaker. So what's your recommended read for the week, Sue Williamson? OK, so my recommended read is The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, which I took part on a, um, uh, a vlog tour um, to launch it. And it's just fun. It's absolutely fun. The characters are great. Um, and it, what it really does is celebrate age, you know. And as I'm staring down the barrel of this, actually, it really does bring home to you that, you know, just because people get old, they don't they don't stop being really good at what it is they do. They don't stop being uh, inquisitive and inquiring. And each and every one of them are really, really interesting people. And I just loved it. I, it's very light. It's not it's not at all gory or frightening. It's but it's it's very insightful. It's very funny, as you would expect from Richard Osman. And I can thoroughly recommend it. And it's in audio, audio as well as physical as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank you all, Adele, Hattie, Julie and Sue for our conversation this morning. Mm -hmm. um, there is just so much I think we need more to unpick and it's a shame that we just have an hour in, in the Zoom room to do that. But I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope that we can work together. I particularly would love to work with you, Hattie and Adele and have more conversations. And now I think Ellen has appeared, so she's going to give us instructions. For... I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone. Um, and I mean, I wasn't prepared, but I've got my book and my e-reader ready to go. Um, if anyone needs a magnificent escapist novel, may I recommend the Australian author Matthew Riley. Um, he writes the most magical action books. I'm on book number four and his brand new book came out yesterday. So there's my little plug. Um, they're like the the young adult, but all ages appropriate, Indiana Jones, Australian, ancient history meets action film. So they've been the perfect companion to an escapist kind of reality. Um, thank you so much to the panel. This has been absolutely fantastic. I've loved hearing about things like accidental viewers and listeners, as well as the commentary that's going on in the chat talking about there's a great discussion happening about the payments and the value that adds in both libraries and at having theatre performances and, and, and who you target and where you target, and how all of that changes based on where you're going. Um, and a great comment from someone who a, a quiet library user yelled at him to be quiet and the three classes of school children around him just giggled as he continued the performance. So I think it's been a really, really fantastic chat. Thank you so much. If everyone who's watching on Attendify could please hit refresh on your window after this video finishes. We just had a quick change of schedule. We'll be going straight into our live Q&A with Sonia Sabri. Um, and then the showcase will follow. So we've got some questions ready for her. Um, please hit refresh and then join us on Attendify shortly.